Zealand do uh, better. And there really is ultimately two elements. One is a clear plan for the rollout of uh, the vaccination program. Uh, and the other is how can we accept probably a little bit of risk, to be honest, a little bit of risk, but to enable sort of stability uh, for, for business. New Zealand is, is borrowing uh, enormous amounts of money. Uh, more and more Kiwis are becoming dependent on the crown in different ways through subsidies and programs. And to use the old adage that the chickens will come home to roost. Um, you know, there is going to be massive debt uh, and there will be an economic correction at, at some point. So how do we try to, to moderate to moderate that and, and finally to learn from other countries which are doing really well? In fact, we can still look at the UK and certain aspects and learn. You know, New Zealand's not, not perfect. A good shout out to Chris Pink, by the way. He's one of, he has a wonderful dry sense of of humour, but it, it, it makes me laugh quite often. It's um, what, one of the big sort of subjects we wanted to discuss today uh, was trade. Um, oh, so yeah. I, I know uh, that's a, an area of expertise for yourself. Um, so obviously, New Zealand's their, their, their top three trade partners: uh, China, Australia, European Union. It almost accounts for uh, half of the total trade. Um, in comparison to the rest of the world for New Zealand. Um, later, I would like to explore on um, the EU and the European Union in terms of future trade and what that looks like. I, I wanted to start with China. Um, now, in the UK, it's safe to say um, our relationship with China has been a bit hampered, if you like, in the past few weeks and months. Now, I understand for New Zealand, Ch China is an even more important trade partner. Um, so what do you see the future of the China and New Zealand trade? Well, I think by and large, it should be positive. Um, you know, New Zealand, I think, was the first to sign a free trade agreement with China. Uh, New Zealand's very much about free trade. So I suspect for the United Kingdom, particularly post-Brexit, as you look towards developing more uh, bilateral free trade agreements in particular, uh, it's, it's relatively new territory, where for, for us, it, it's fairly uh, normal. Um, so our relationship with China on a trading perspective is very important. Um, it's going to grow. Um, it's got more scope, uh, but it is also a little bit testing, uh, shall we say. And I suppose I sit very firmly on the side that says we want to trade with China, uh, but New Zealand must maintain actually a, a truly uh, independent foreign policy and relationship to that. In other words, New Zealand must uh, and should still stand up for the values um, it believes and not uh, compromise those uh, for our trade. So the issue of Hong Kong uh, or the Uyghurs, uh, to be honest, if we jump right into that, uh, you know, that's really important certainly to me that we stand up for human rights uh, in the case of the Uyghurs uh, and the people of Hong Kong, uh, but also call out the destruction of a democracy. Uh, so hats off to your team over there uh, on both sides of the house who are actually condemning uh, the break, the, the destruction of the, the Sino-British Treaty in Hong Kong uh, and calling out the behaviours there. But so it, it's a fine balance, I suppose, in all of what I'm saying. Um, we all need to trade. New Zealand's uh, wealth, uh, the strength of our economy is, is highly leveraged off China, very highly leveraged. Um, but we, we must not allow ourselves to become just trade focused alone towards silence. Um, so that, that's the, the issue in our parliament at the moment that we discuss frequently. So uh, how has the uh, discussion been in New Zealand around the kind of China Australia situation, which has been getting quite a lot of press recently in the UK and the kind of very kind of worsening relations there, the, the plight of Australian wine, for example, has been quite well documented. Yes, it's, well, they, they may have benefited being slightly tongue in cheek. The Aussies might have benefited because most of us started going and drinking Aussie wines, which is not our normal, not our normal habit. Um, but look, I, I sit firmly on the side that you stand with your allies. So I think New Zealand should be uh, more closely aligned to Australia. Um, but I'd also say it has to be slightly tempered. The, the New Zealand approach to matters is slightly more uh, perhaps nuanced um, and cautious. Uh, and when we deal with China, um, 
you, you prefer a no surprises policy. Um, Australia, you could argue, uh, was slightly more aggressive and they have absolutely every right uh, to be so, but that tends to create a, a reaction and you did begin to see the sort of making the, like a metronome, but it sort of bounces backwards and forwards and gets more and more uh, difficult. But I think for New Zealand, as I say, one, uh, you, you lean in towards uh, your allies uh, and silence at times doesn't uh, help. But I personally see it also as a, a warning that New Zealand should realise, as should other countries, um, how trade can be weaponised. Uh, and so, yep, Australia made a stand, uh, stand on some issues uh, and China chose to use uh, trade levers to try and uh, punish them. And um, I, I think we'd be naive, doesn't matter if it's in the UK, certainly here in New Zealand, other Pacific islands, to think that those levers won't be pulled on us uh, in the future, if we're seen to be stepping out of line. I mean, the history and obviously geography of our fellow Commonwealth friends, Australia, means you know the, the relationship with New Zealand is always likely to be an important and valuable one. Um, I know New Zealand and Australia um, have been committed to the process called the Single Economic Market uh, Agenda uh, for quite some time now. Um, what would a national party government mean for the relationship of New Zealand and Australia? Well, I'd hope it would try to actually re-strengthen the ties. I mean, don't um, I, I don't want to say it's broken down. We're, we're still very good uh, friends uh, across multiple levels, but uh, it's probably been a bit tested over recent years. Um, again, an absent on some of the geopolitical questions uh, including but not exclusively around China, uh, New Zealand's absence from some joint communiques, which uh, the likes of the UK or Australia are part of, uh, and then a lot of tension around the deporting effectively of uh, New Zealand citizens in Australia back to New Zealand. So there's there's been tensions, um, and I suppose from a national party and certainly my perspective, it's probably trying to reintroduce a little bit of uh, respect uh, from New Zealand to Australia, then in turn coming back. So there's probably not a lot that's going to to change. It's not, this is nothing overly dramatic, but it's probably just a little bit of um, respect. And I suppose I keep just coming back to leaning in towards your, your allies. So, if, you know, your best mate has decided to do something. Um, you should take, or we should take that fairly seriously and to, to not engage with your mates. Um, should be raising some, some questions. And then I suppose it's uh, a few very particular things for New Zealand with Australia is how do we facilitate, if you will, trade together? I'm not arguing that we're a trading block. I mean, we compete in some areas, but how do we work together in that space, particularly into the Pacific? Uh, that's, a, I would suggest, major significant, uh, significant geopolitical interest uh, to us. Um, the islands, if you will, feel an affinity to New Zealand and Australia. Um, we want that to continue um, to make sure others don't um, hone on in, shall we say. So, you know, we need to be able to cooperate in that space. And that will also then flow into military aspects as well. Um, I would certainly like to see a lot more uh, interaction there and interoperability. I know it's getting really uh, specific, uh, but New Zealand needs to absolutely make sure our armed forces um, uh, interoperable with the likes of Australia and in fact we try to, to work together a little bit more cooperatively in that space rather than Australia doing its thing and New Zealand doing its own. Another uh, key sort of partner for the Euro um, for New Zealand is the European Union. Um, we, we saw I think at the end of last year um, there was a provisional agreement on two more chapters of future trade uh, one was small and medium enterprise, and the other was capital movements. How, how do you foresee the, the European Union and New Zealand going forward in terms of trade and, and in terms of that potential partnership? Um, slowly. Uh, look, New, New Zealand's very open to a free trade agreement with, with just about um, everybody. As I said at the start, for us, it's a fairly natural space uh, to be. We as a New Zealanders become uh, wealthy when we can trade with others because there's too few of us to trade alone. 
So we're very open to free trade agreements is what we do. And the EU is no um, exception, um, but we're, we're running into understandable difficulties around the nature of agriculture. Um, so we may have some chapters agree. So the movement of capital is uh, relatively easy to agree. But if you had two areas which are proving somewhat uh, troublesome, um, is this, well, agriculture, and to be honest, it's probably going to be the same with the UK. Um, the other is, is ultimately, it's the wider issues of what should or should not be in the agreement. So um, you get a lot of debate now about how much of climate change, for example, should be incorporated into a trade bill, um, aspects of human rights. None of these things in themselves, I should stress, are, are, are wrong. Uh, but the question becomes, and it's certainly a debate here, often between the left and the right of politics, of how far should trade agreements go or be used to um, manifest or encourage wider political topics? In other words, should we be using a trade agreement um, to promote a certain view of, of human rights? Should we be using a trade agreement uh, in some of the controversial areas of, of climate change? Uh, so there's a lot of political debate here around that, and arguably it's going to slow uh, some things down. Uh, and finally, I suspect the EU will have to get its head around what we call the Treaty of Waitangi. It's the agreement between the Crown and Māori, um, which uh, in short provides some rights to the Indigenous uh, Māori, the First Peoples here. Um, and often that just manifests that the Crown must consult with Māori before some decisions are made. And that can be a little confusing to some other countries that go, you're the government, what? can't you just make the decision? Why do you have to go and talk to another group of people? So that comes naturally to us, it takes a little bit of explaining at times to, to other countries. It's interesting, you mentioned agriculture. Um, we spoke uh, to various different Indian officials uh, on our platform just a week ago, they're going through their own uh, agricultural changes and it, it's, uh, um, it's fair to say that that's been widely talked about uh, both in here in Canada and in a number of different countries. Um, obviously New Zealand uh, agriculture plays a, a massive part, I think you're the 12th largest uh, agriculture uh, exporter and you're second in terms of dairy uh, in the world and I think number one in sheep meat. Um, so uh, naturally, agriculture plays a, a massive role uh, for, for you guys. Um, how do you see the agricultural market going for New Zealand? Do, do you think that will continue to play a, a heavy role uh, for New Zealand in the future? The reason I ask this is because we had um, a number of uh, number of panelists from India who were sort of saying that they need to move away from agriculture. Uh, they need to have less people uh, in, in their workforce in agriculture. Um, is that a similar kind of thought process you think New Zealand needs to move towards or do you think agriculture will still play a, a massive part? I think it still will play a massive part for New Zealand. I think there are probably some parallels with other agricultural uh, nations such as India, but I, I think our dynamics are, are different and perhaps the drivers, uh, I, I look, I can't presume for India, um, but I suspect some of their drivers to move from agriculture are very different to ours. I mean, at, at day's end, um, yeah, it's it's part of our psyche. It's part of something we do uh, particularly well, uh, and we are generating quite a lot of wealth from it. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't. I would argue, overly dominate our country's workforce, though. It's not as if all the energy is going into agriculture and nothing else. So, I, I don't think we're going to move away from it. But I would put the, the caveat that New Zealand does need to diversify um, a bit further. I mean, it's, it's the classic case, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. So before COVID, uh, there were elements of that from international education and certainly tourism were becoming for New Zealand uh, major, major money earners, um, almost competing uh, with agriculture. Uh, obviously, that's pretty much dead now. Um, so agriculture good, I think it will still track, uh, but New Zealand will do well to try and, and diversify a little bit, um, a little bit further. Certainly we can relook at tourism, how on earth that's going to look post COVID. Um, the other is, it might seem a bit odd to say, little old New Zealand, but in the technology 
space as well. Put in really simply, we're awake when you are asleep and vice versa. So there's some opportunities there for us to, uh, to be engaging. Um, and we've got some good tech here. We've got some really smart people. And what I've noticed is they leave, uh, they, <laughs> they head to London. Uh, and they head to Vancouver and they head to the States. So we're, we're still looking here and going, well, what could we do? What could we do differently uh, to sort of try and keep some of that talent here and develop as I say, a slightly more diversified economy and market? So, um, so Neil touched briefly on India, which kind of brings me back in a roundabout way to the um, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or the RCEP. And I, I kind of had a look through a report your committee had released on that and kind of, I think it's going to be ratified in parliament or it's going through final stages. Um, I, one thing that I did see you, you touched on there was the impact kind of India dropping out um, in the earlier stages had, um, so I guess a twofold question, one kind of for our viewers, to put it in simple terms, what is the RCEP and do you think it will be and what kind of impact do you think that will have for New Zealand and, and two where do you what sort of reasons do you think there were for India not wanting to become part of that and how as a nation do you kind of find it dealing with India on a trade level because we've had people on our platform before saying it can sometimes be a bit difficult to kind of do deals with India but India as a country that so many people want to do more business with and how do you think kind of New Zealand can can do more business with India going forward? Yeah, if we start with the uh, RCEP, I don't know what it is about acronyms and trade deals like <laughs> RECP and then the CPTPP, but, oh, tongue twisters. Um, look, in terms of the RCEP, I mean, for those listeners that are not aware, it's basically the likes of New Zealand, Australia, um, up into the ASEAN uh, area, so the likes of Thailand and Cambodia and, and so forth, uh, and, and much more than that. So in short, it's good. Um, deals are better than no deal. Uh, personally, I don't think it's going to make a massive impact uh, to New Zealand, partly because we have a number of bilateral agreements um, already. But Fundamentally, more trade alliances are better than, than none, in my opinion. Um, so that's a, a good thing. Um, India not being as cooperative is not really a surprise, certainly to me. Um, New Zealand would certainly like to do more trade uh, with India. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I mean, gosh, we'd love a free trade agreement. Uh, but in practical terms, that's not really on the, the cards. And I suspect part of it's just simple demographics. Um, India is massive. Um, it's got uh, some incredible technologies and development occurring, but also they're trying, from what I can see, uh, to pull a lot of people out of very uh, basic uh, farming and, and they're trying to upskill. I'm trying to think of the right terms, not to be diplomatic, but long and the short, I think they want to focus internally. They're trying to work out how do we actually, with the people we have, the skills and resources we have, how do we leverage internally first before trying to, if you will, engage from the, the outside. So put in incredibly rough terms, why, why open up free trade for New Zealand goods per se when you know, India can develop it itself? Um, so that's very basic how I see it. And agriculture is a good example. Why, why bring in New Zealand meats and, and milk and, and other products uh, when actually India could try to, to leverage within itself. Um, so obviously that's for India to decide. So I but I'm, I'm, would love to see an agreement, but I, I, I don't think it's going to, to happen, or well, not anytime soon. I think that's a good point uh, uh, about India trying to um, fix the sort of internal issues. We, we've spoken to a number of different Indian officials and ministers, and I think it's quite well documented, Modi's uh, push for on infrastructure in India, um, the real push for improving infrastructure in India. And obviously that's something that's gonna most likely be fixed from within um, before they can really uh, push from outside. So I think that's a really good point. Um, I, I wanted to talk about the future of the New Zealand economy post COVID. Um, there's been a number of different studies uh, that I've seen on, on New Zealand uh, about how 
you know, COVID-19 is having a massive impact on the economy now, and it could actually lead to potential, uh, some great innovation uh, for New Zealand. H how do you see that happening uh, in, in terms of as we hopefully get to maybe what towards the back end of this year or early next year, uh, do, do you see New Zealand's economy changing much post COVID? Um, it's a really difficult one um, because had you asked me a year ago, um, I would have said we're going to have uh, it's going to be a massive impact. You know, we're going to see major unemployment. We're going to see uh, significant recessionary uh, dynamics. Uh, we'll see the housing market implode, uh, the share market under stress. And here we are a year later. And put bluntly, I'm wrong. <laughs> so, uh, share markets tracking along. Yet we have more unemployment, which is still unfortunate, but it's nowhere near the catastrophic levels. And paradoxically, our housing market is um, going through the roof in a good way. Um, prices are going up. Uh, interest rates are low. Borrowing is easy. So there's a whole lot of very confusing uh, signals. Um, but importantly, that's on the surface. So at the moment, things look OK. But when you begin to scratch the surface a little bit more, there are at least two things. One is enormous uh, government borrowing and spending. Uh, to be fair, New Zealand was in a pretty good position going into COVID that we had a pretty low uh, debt to GDP compared to many other uh, countries. New Zealand's almost obsessed with keeping it under 30 to almost 20%. Um, so that's put us in an okay position. Uh, the other is that when you're talking to various economists and banks, though, that the pressure is building in the background. So we're seeing more defaults uh, on loans, higher risk profiles, uh, more defaults to our tax system. Um, sorry, our, our tax collector, you'd be Her Majesty's Revenue. Here we call it inland revenue. Um, so there's, there's worrying signs of, of stress. So most feel that within the year, uh, we are going to see uh, some major economic impacts on our uh, economy. Exactly how that's going to look is just very difficult to tell, or rather how it will manifest. Um, the positive side is that because we are so strong on the uh, agricultural side, is that people still need our, our food. Uh, so that will probably hold. Um, but where we're coming, as I was intimating earlier, is, is around our education and the tourism sectors. They're dead. Um, many of our institutions relied on international students. Uh, our second biggest money earner was tourism, and we don't have any. Um, so that's causing more and more problems. And I suppose, finally, much of it will then come down to other economies. If they become more nationalistic, understandably, their economies are struggling, they look inward, uh, then dealing with little old New Zealand might become a secondary or tertiary consideration, and we will find it pretty, pretty tough. But I, I, I'm struggling to give you a, a great definitive answer as I try to stare into my crystal ball, but I'm, I'm happy where we're holding at the moment. The things feel okay, but as I say, under the surface, there's there's challenges. And I, I, I think for a lot of New Zealanders, they think we're, we've sorted COVID on a health perspective and they think we're okay economically. So it might be a shock when the latter comes unstuck. Well, I think uh, at the end of the day, it's going, it's going to be time once COVID, hopefully, we, you can move past that. It'll be time for the Prime Minister now with her majority to actually prove herself as a, as a kind of politician and put into place these uh, glorious kind of policies and ideas that she she uh, enthuses upon. So I think that'll be interesting once you actually move past that and see the impact of the her domestic policies and obviously on the international stage are having, you know, I think that'll be when we see as well the National Party kind of come back into people's minds and start rising up again in, in the polls, I think, in the, on that side of things. I think so. I mean, national, to be fair, has to um, get back to its values and express them uh, clearly. You know, we are a centre-right conservative uh, party. We have a broad range of views within that uh, camp, but you know, we have some pretty clear values. Uh, we need to realign to them because let's be honest. Uh, even in this public conversation, 
uh, the National Party let itself down as much as in the case that the Labour Party uh, won. However, uh, as New Zealand does uh, vaccinate more, and I think COVID, COVID's impact begins to, to lessen, I think certainly a lot of New Zealanders will turn their attention back to those domestic policies you referenced, Paul, and they will go, why is our uh, need for, for shelter and homes uh, quadrupled in the last uh, four years? You know, why is the economy not moving quite as fast as it uh, could? Why are more people on welfare um, and so forth? Why is our infrastructure dilapidated? So those have all been parked um, for now, but they are just beginning to start up again. And yeah, I think it'll be an interesting, interesting three years to see to see what happens there. And if I might make the political point, how much the government will try to continue the COVID angle uh, to to capture people's attention to that, uh, rather than focusing on the wider domestic issues. It's interesting we're talking um, about the, the current government. Um, I'll, I'll come back with some of the trade stuff, but it's something that I've been actually wanting to ask uh, or anyone from New Zealand, to be honest, about uh, uh, Jacinda Ardern. In terms of, in, in the UK, if, if I don't think we know a lot about her. I, I don't think many people could tell you more than one policy uh, about her, but she seems to have this very likeable character. I think that um, seems to be quite well received and well liked. In New Zealand, is it similar? Is there a, is there a sense of people really like her as, as a person, as a character, um, more so than her actual policies? Is it more like, I don't know, it's, um, less of substance, more of style? Is that something that you see amongst uh, New Zealanders? Um, that, that, if you will, um, accusation is often put their substance over style. There, there's an element of truth to it. Um, but I probably want to start, I think she's actually um, a very uh, engaging person. Um, you know, she is a very good communicator, very empathetic, and I think actually quite genuinely caring. Uh, and when she meets people, there's nothing false in that. Um, you know, I think she brings those really positive, um, empathetic and human qualities. Uh, and so particularly when we've had the tragedies um, here, um, she's exceptional. And look, I'm saying this is an opposition MP, but um, it's not fake. I suppose that's what I'm wanting to say. This is not just made up. Uh, she visited one of the schools in my electorate the other day, and she had people in tears, and not because of any other re in any other reason than she was able to genuinely uh, connect with them. And so, I think as a centre right party, uh, we have to acknowledge those skills and that it's genuine. The problem does begin to develop, though, um, at least twofold. Um, one, once she set a direction, she doesn't seem to have an ability to change. And it doesn't matter if it's COVID or other statements that she's made. Once she's said something, uh, willingly or otherwise, she feels committed to it and in some ways unable to say uh, sorry. Um, so that's a bit of a, a, a weak point. Uh, and the other that does seem to be, and it's probably as much to do with the colleagues and political party around her um, to actually make some pretty tough decisions on issues beyond COVID. Um, so whether that's a lack of substance as much as just a, a lack of political skill or even dominance to her party to say, look, we absolutely have to make some tough decisions to address these issues, because that's, that's where you get the tension that you may see overseas of someone who says amazing things about child poverty, we're going to solve it. And it's a beautiful speech and wonderful intentions. Uh, but it's got worse actually on most metrics here. Um, same with housing, people who need housing, as I mentioned earlier, they said they'd fix it uh, in their first year and here we are in year four and it's quadrupled. Um, so there is that growing tension and an awareness in New Zealanders' minds to go, well, one thing is said, but another thing's been done. Um, and finally on that, there's been two things that need to happen. One is my political party needs to absolutely hone in on that um, and just show the gap. Uh, but it's also within our media. Um, it's possibly a thing politicians always complain about, but the media to start actually uh, calling that out rather than celebrating the headlines. 
does it make it hard to um, almost a, a attack Jacinda Ardern in, in some ways because she has that, like you said, she is a great, phenomenal uh, communicator. She's brilliant at having that uh, sympathetic ear. Does it does that make it harder because you almost straight away come across as the villain attacking, um, yeah. you know, this really nice caring woman who's trying to look after our country? Does that make it difficult? Oh, look, it certainly does. Um, it certainly does. But, but for exactly what you just mentioned, Sunil, you, you look like a villain, you're being nasty. Um, and particularly if you put a layer of identity politics over things now, um, you know, to be blunt, if I was to challenge her on something, then I'm just a nasty white male, um, which just adds to the <laughs> fuel to the fire. However, I also think there is a way around it, um, which is you, you challenge reasonably and rationally um, and consistently. So you don't have to be nasty. Uh, you don't have to be taking cheap shots um, or trying to score um, easy points. I think as an opposition, it's actually to try and be the, the contrast. So yep, um, allow the emoting to happen, the wonderful and glorious rhetorical phrases. Um, we don't need to compete. Arguably, we probably can't. Um, so just be the, the calm, rational, consistent voice that if you will politely point out the problems. So yeah, avoid cheap um, point scoring. Um, and just as an opposition, just day after day go, well, why is it that child poverty is getting worse? Um, you know, we're concerned about is that as well. I suppose there's an aspect that we can mirror or reflect back at the Prime Minister, some of her language. You know, we do care. We care about kids. Um, but, but why is it that it's getting worse? So I think um, we don't want to be enthralled by her style and thinking that we can um, compete with it. I think there's another avenue, as I say, it's the calm, rational, considered opposition and just, just chip away. And I think in our case, a lot of New Zealanders will begin to respond, he says, hopefully. I think that's, and that's a very good point. And I think that's something that clinical kind of approach of almost taking taking apart that kind of veneer is something that Judith Collins did really well in the the debates in the lead up to the election. I think obviously the election itself was really overshadowed by the COVID situation, which kind of really saw Labour Party home. But I feel like, as you say, that approach of, yeah, like you say, not trying to compete on, a, on that showmanship level, but to be to be there and just point out the flaws, point out where they're going wrong. It is something that I think did work during those debates and I think could work going forward. And I, I'm not sure what you kind of think about the current situation in the National Party, but I feel almost as you see this undercurrent in the media of, you know, someone else is thinking of a leadership bit here. There's the, the next John Key standing over there. So I don't think that helps as well you know I think what I'm not sure what you think about that and those kind of background that background chattering I think it's the nature of any election loss uh, when I was in government um, I took some time if you will to to look at the other side and see what they were going through and in Labour's case uh, destructive results uh, in fighting machinations for leadership uh, and you know a despondency at one point until uh, the polls rose in the case of uh, Jacinda's ascension. Um, and I think there's, for me personally, learnings in that because my party's going through or has been going through very uh, similar dynamics. You know, there's nothing like success to, to help unity. But I think there's a, a few things that the party can learn. One is, as we're doing, uh, working with our leader and going, right, what, what do we together uh, need to do. We, you know, where is the strengths that we together um, can bring? Um, the second part is for the party, as I suggested earlier, is just to get back to its core values. Um, so that you can't force these things, uh, but if the party, both its members and certainly the caucus, uh, can, if you will, understand its values and reinterpret them into a modern time, that it makes our messaging a lot easier um, and clearer. Um, and the, the final part of it all is, is ultimately understanding that, you know, 
this sort of thing takes a bit of time. You know, I definitely want to win the next election. Let's be very clear about that. But, you know, realistically, parties go through cycles. We have good times and we have bad times. Um, and so we're in a, a bad time. We have a disastrous election result. Uh, we have colleagues who are still smarting uh, from that. But as I say, with a bit of focus on who are we as a party, what do we stand for as a centre-right conservative party, knowing that the New Zealanders are out there that want our policies, you know? Um, what do we need to do? Uh, so that's just going to take a bit of time for us to, to, if you will, stop looking at ourselves, hear what the Kiwis want, because actually I would suggest a lot of New Zealanders do resonate with the National Party message uh, once we start listening to them. And I might add, not romanticizing the past, like we had a great period under the premiership of John Key, and there are some learnings from that, uh, but romanticizing it and thinking that we can simply recreate it, for me personally, is, is not the way forward either. You know, time moves forward, there's always different dynamics. Um, yeah, so it's, so it's a little amorphous, a bit over the place but um you know that the party has good values uh, it's a message that does resonate uh we just need to reconnect uh, with our members and to those values and i think we can be the formidable force uh, that we were yeah i think you know like you say it's a patience is key because you know just before covid you were ahead or neck and neck in the polls. so i find it hard to believe all those people have suddenly become um you know labor value labor values wise over the past year and there's definitely you know i think we'll see that rebalancing going forward oh i think so look really simply really simply a lot of people felt that the current government saved them you know uh when new zealanders looked overseas they saw covid ravaging countries um huge lockdowns well i suppose every lockdown's huge but you know what i mean uh, you know, in the UK, America, across the globe, uh, and we did relatively well. And I think a lot of people, particularly in our older demographic, felt that the government saved them and they voted accordingly. Um, and I think there's two, uh, a well, we call it she'll be right attitude, sort of just museum, just go, go with how things are. It's not change tech. You know, the government's managing things at the moment. She'll be right. Let's just hold. Uh, but let's be honest as well. Uh, National didn't help itself. Leadership changes, scandals, uh, confusions. Um, those are devastating uh, to any political, any political party. Um, so that definitely had a, an effect as well. But I would say, certainly on the ground now, I, in my electorate, I have a number of people who um, thought they were being strategic by voting Labour. Um, thought they'd done the right thing, who now regret it. Uh, so my encouragement to them is to remember that uh, and then to vote the right way, all puns intended, uh, in 2023. It's interesting, uh, talking of um, the New Zealanders making uh, she'll be right kind of, um, having that kind of analogy in, in, in their head. There was a really good study recently that talked about how Jacinda Ardern, um, Joe Biden, had some similarities in their election win, which was in this COVID, uh, if you like, election year, one of the big thing uh, voters were looking for was sympathy. People, leaders, you can really show sympathy whilst this world is in chaos and it, you know we're suffering. One of the big traits, which is not normally a trait you would associate with a leader or something that we would really care about in a normal climate. We normally want our leaders to be strong and have the uh, you know, strong characteristics. But one of the big things that both these two polled really high on was their ability to sympathize um, and show that empathy with their um, with, with their people. Um, so it'll be interesting because most likely come election time next time, she won't, well, hopefully won't have that kind of, you know, we won't be in a, a global work, um, epidemic or that kind of issue. So she won't probably have that to fall back on. Um, and I, I want to touch on the, the, the cycles thing that you, you mentioned. I, I see a lot of what's happening in New Zealand, similar to maybe the UK in the 1960s and 70s, where 
we had this real move towards liberal democracy and it really uh, started as something you would say center left and it just started to move more and more and more left and we saw a real um, uh, a real division in, in terms of what the country was standing for and then obviously we had uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher here but I'd, I'd argue it also was the same in America we had Ronald Reagan in, in America who between the pair of them they really pushed for the center right uh, almost new awakening and beginning and it seems New Zealand are at a sort of similar stage where this kind of liberalness is really uh, taking over the, 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 the country. I, I saw, I think in this election, it's one of the most, um, uh, one of the most diverse uh, election cabinets that you have, which is fantastic in the sense of, it's good to see uh, representation, but there have been many arguments to say how many of those are by merit and how many of those are, um, to look at quotas, that's what we, we've seen quite a lot of criticism towards, and it, it's hard to tell um, right now. Is that something, again, the, the National Party is going to be looking at going forward in terms of, it, I don't want to use identity politics, but it almost seems uh, sometimes with Jacinda Ardern's decision making that there is a kind of tactical ploy there? Yeah, um, firstly, empathy is good, um, and I'd agree with that first. Um, uh, statement or that research. I mean, particularly when people begin to suffer or struggle, they like a bit of sympathy or empathy. Uh, however, uh, if you will, platitudes can only last for, for so long, then people want something more. So you can make the argument that uh, the Ardern's and Biden's rode the wave at the right time. Uh, had it been six months later, uh, things might be different, but um, and I think that will become an issue for the current government here, that kindness, empathy only goes so far. Um, in terms of where New Zealand is, is certainly moving to the left um, and liberal in the, the worst definition of that word, because I, I define myself as a, a, a liberal with an L in terms of uh, freedoms. Um, but you know, liberalism in terms of the likes of identity politics, where the look or the emotion is more important than the substance or the reason, um, we have real problems there, I would argue, at the moment. And it's at least twofold. One is those ideas are, are well inculcated into our education system, both universities. Uh, try being a conservative in a New Zealand university now, it's uh, almost impossible. Um, and then certainly through into our, our schools. So you've, you've got a system which is, is churning out a, a very particular uh, mindset and a media here in New Zealand which, which facilitates that. But to be fair, conservatism uh, is in a little bit of crisis too. Um, you would hear me keep talking about values. Um, there's confusion by being generous uh, and some on the right of, of what those values are. What does what modern conservatism look like? Um, and I think as well, there's a little bit of a wider crisis of just having that intellectual grunt anymore around what conservatism is. So you mentioned someone like Reagan. Um, yep, he was a, an incredible president and front man if you want, but in behind that was a lot of, uh, and actually Thatcher as well, a lot of good conservative thought and an understanding of what it means to be conservative in this, this modern age. And we're, we're lacking that um, a little bit. Uh, but what I find when I go around the country is New Zealanders desire, if you will, for conservative values is still there, but there's two elements in play. One is the wanting to hear it articulated well. And politicians, including myself, can't articulate it well if we don't fully understand them. Um, you can't speak clearly about something you don't fully understand. Uh, and the second is that we've unfortunately got a, a dynamic in play here that to stick one's head above the parapet to say, look, I'm not really a fan of identity politics or I think we're getting a bit too left. You get cut off pretty quickly. It's a new form of bullying. And I don't know whether you see it in the UK, but um, I suspect That's you do because unfortunately he's dead now. Sir Roger Scruton. Uh, talked about the censorship of the conservatives or the, of the right, that you're just not allowed to speak. Um, and that's, that's a worrying problem in any liberal democracy. 
I think, yeah, we, we're seeing exactly the same things here, especially in universities. Um, it's very difficult to be a, you know, a student at university and a, and, and out, out and proud kind of conservative. It, you can get quite, it's become quite difficult and something that's come, come up actually a lot in our media at the moment with, I think, new kind of laws looking to be brought in to make sure that people aren't in a way made to feel unwelcome at university if they do hold views which aren't um, of the you know student norm so to speak one thing I kind of wanted to bring up still on the subject of New Zealand politics was um, I guess ACT New Zealand and where they fit into the picture um, I guess what I'd be interested to know is if we were to say in 2023, end up in a similar situation to the election before last, where the position New Zealand first were in, like which side of the fence do you think they would they would fall on? Would they go into coalition with you, which I think they have done in their history, or or are they would they um, look to keep Labour in power? I, I'm not sure where they stand. I know they I think have quite sort of libertarian views almost, so I'm not really sure on their positioning in that situation? Yeah, oh, look, they're very much a, a right-wing uh, party. Um, I, I, I couldn't see them uh, going with the left uh, in any shape or form. Uh, we would have a much more natural um, alliance. Um, they're what I would call a confused libertarianism. Um, and it's going to get more confusing for them as they uh, become, well, they've got more votes now. They used to have only one person in parliament. Now I think they've got 10. You'd think I'd know these things, eh? But anyway. <laughs> um, so once you've got multiple people, any party begins to have tensions. And um, I think it's easy to have, a, a, if you will, a, a purity of thought when there's only one, one person. Uh, but they are more libertarian rather than conservative. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't work together. A lot of economic uh, policies, we're, we're pretty much... Um, align. In fact, there's probably, you know, suggestions at times that we're stealing their policy and vice versa. Um, we've worked together well in the past on education and other things. Um, even aspects like freedom of speech, we're, we're by and large um, aligned. So where the rub occasionally will come is, is more of the, let's say, the social issues where a conservative viewpoint says we're all individuals, but in the community, versus a libertarian mindset that says, just me, don't care about others, just me. That's where there's a little bit of rub, but it's a very long way of saying, Paul, I think, you know, ACT and New Zealand, uh, National can cooperate quite easily. I think it's gonna be um, an interesting forthcoming election. Uh, I think that you, there's obviously a considerable amount of time uh, before then, but it, it is interesting because, you know, we, I suppose, for, for me and Paul, um, being conservative and quite openly conservative, um, we, we had this similar chat with John Howard, the, the former Australian Prime Minister, just two weeks ago. Um, and we were just, yeah, he, he, was, he was great. And uh, I couldn't believe how he's still so sharp on everything that's going on currently in the current climate. He, he knows everything that's going on, whether it's Australian, UK, um, any form of politics, he's well up to date. Um, and we had a really long chat with him and we, we covered a lot of stuff on identity politics and he pulled out a, a great line, I'm not going to say it as well as him, um, which was along the lines of um, he doesn't believe in identity politics, he believes in creating policies uh, for the population. For example, his big thing was small business, you know, I'm, I'm helping small businesses, which means I'm helping um, black people, Chinese people, Italian people, Indian people, there is no I'm not doing this for any particular skin color. I'm not doing this for any race. I'm just doing this for the population of Australia. And he really was pushing forward in saying that that's what more conservative uh, forums, conservative parties should be doing, um, as opposed to what he sees right now is a lot of governments, they choose the minority, and then they choose the policy, which he really disagreed with. Um, so it was very fascinating um, hearing him talk like that. Um, and that kind of moves on quite nicely to my question for coming up for this uh, election in 2023. What sort of plan or like what sort of strategy will the 
uh, New Zealand Party be taking, National Party be taking, because uh, we saw our Conservative Party here, we had, I think, quite a strong campaign. It was a campaign really built on reason, really built on, um, I, I remember that even the 2015 campaign, I think that it was clear that the economic plan all must have been said a hundred times by David Cameron almost a day. Uh, Boris Johnson, similar, you know, the, the, there was really clear messaging in what we um, were trying to do. And I think they highlighted really well the, um, some of the, the bad aspects of the, the current or the potential future, what the implications of a Labour government, what it would look like if Ed Miliband was the, the leader. And, and I think that they really was a targeted approach. With the National Party, I, I've seen you've highlighted five sort of key, um, if you like, uh, subjects that you will be tackling. Is that going to be the sort of basis of a manifesto for 2023? Um, whether those are the five, I, I don't know in so far as lots of water under the bridge, but um, no more than five, uh, hold on, I better back up. Um, I, I think for us to succeed, we need very simple, clear messages on only several topics. Um, whether it's five or four, um, I, I think in the nature of modern communications and people's willingness to listen, uh, any successful party is just going to have to hone in on a couple of points. So I suppose what those are may well change, but I think the National Party will do well to just focus on a couple and unrelentingly drive those home because most of us are busy. Um, you know, families, jobs, there's Saturday sport. Um, they're not listening to politics. So we have to say things many, many times, many, many times. And if we're talking over 10, 20 topics, it gets lost. Uh, but the other really important thing, and I don't think we do that well in politics in general, is speak in a way that people want to listen to. In other words, it's very easy for me, I probably fall into it myself, to talk in political jargon or in a way that makes sense to me. But if I'm selling a tax cut, you know, just saying, hey, we're gonna cut your taxes. And, you know, we need, to, we need to say to people, you know what, actually, we're giving you more choice. You can, by keeping your money, you can decide whether or not you wanna buy a new car or go on a holiday or pay your mortgage off quicker. So it's about how we message as well. Um, so yeah, simple messages, very few of them, often repeated, uh, but making sure that we, say them in a way that people understand almost emotively and rationally. Um, and it's not something we've done well uh, in the past. Uh, it's one of the challenges I'd say at times with conservative parties, which lean towards more the reasoned philosophical positions and considered that it can come across a bit dry, where the left are much better at finding the buzzwords, which make people go, oh, isn't that lovely? Um, so we've got to be a bit smarter in that space. I think there are a lot of parallels yeah. in, in a way between the, I guess, Conservative Party of Canada and, and yourselves. You, you're both up against kind of uh, two similar personalities who kind of have similar viewpoints ar around certain social and, um, you know, kind of uh, topics of the day. So yeah, you're both facing similar issues of how to get that get that message across. And I think it's something that yeah, they say it takes a lot, it just takes a lot of thinking about the messaging and, and really drilling it home over time. I think, well, yes. So it, it requires a bit of, um, if you will, internal discipline. It's why I say, you know, we've got to get a good grounding on our conservative principles uh, and then how to, um, best articulate those. Um, so there's that. Um, and then it becomes actually engaging with other conservative parties. Um, you know, I certainly try to keep my contacts, doesn't matter if it's in the UK, Canada, Australia, um, amongst others, um, talking to them, what, what have you learned? Um, you know, what can we learn from, from you becomes really, really important. So I think more engagement, um, even like um, Stephen Harper, who's now running a uh, good man, um, you know, I've been in communication with him, you know, what the International Democratic Union or IDU does, really important pulling those ideas together because, you know, 
New Zealand alone isn't going to fix this. Um, you know, we can learn from others. So that's really important. I think that's, that's really, it's a really good point um, in terms of even the Conservative Party of Canada. And it seems both the the parties, uh, the, the current administrations in Canada and New Zealand have very, two, if you like, charismatic leaders. Um, I'm not sure how strong those parties are if we go past leader. You know, I, I'll give an example of Labour um, in, in our country under the Tony Blair era. I, I think as, as much as we may not enjoy saying this, they were a very strong team. There was a really strong, uh, even if you go past Blair, his, his immediate cabinet was a very strong cabinet, a very in uh, sync cabinet. Do you see, is that similar with the uh, Labour Party in New Zealand currently? Um, where they have a kind of in-sync cabinet or is it more Jacinda Ardern cabinet? She's the one, you, you vote purely for Jacinda Ardern as opposed to the party in general. I think it's more the latter. Um, I think it's more the latter uh, and that manifests itself. I, from what I can see, so it's my personal observation, I, I don't think they are a coherent uh, team. I think there are tensions, uh, different factions. Um, but it also manifests itself as that you by and large only see the Prime Minister and maybe one or two of her very senior trusted colleagues in media. Uh, most of the others are kept well clear. It's particularly choreographed uh, and tightly managed. Now that's smart politics, but it also shows you that there isn't that um, depth, shall we say. So I think certainly in the last election, uh, we saw a lot of people voting for the prime minister, and as a consequence, their party rather than the other way round. But I would make the observation: look, charismatic leadership has its place. Um, but I, I would resist personally saying that your leader consequently must be charismatic. Um, I think what ultimately breeds, if you will, political unity is success. So it doesn't matter if it's John Key or, or Tony Blair, David Cameron, Scott Morrison at the moment. Um, if they're bringing about success, uh, people and their party in particular will, will kick in behind, whether they're charismatic or not. That's a, that's a good point. Um, finally, I, I think uh, a massive talking point on this platform, I think we, we've mentioned it before, obviously, Can Zook. I understand that's something that you'll be uh, playing quite a big role in? Yeah, so from uh, the National Party side, I've been asked to um, leave that. Um, have been following Kanzo for uh, a long time and before uh, politics. Um, so I just think it's a great idea. Um, you know, the stood right at the start, more, uh, more engagement between countries is better. Multilateralism is really important. And we're seeing that breaking down deliberately uh, around the world. It's not just happening accidentally. There's a deliberate strategy by some countries. Um, and it's a natural, well, it's not really a pairing, it's a, a quadding, whatever the right verb is, um, you know, of these four Commonwealth uh, countries. There's so many similarities that it just makes engagement important. So um, I'm very keen to keep that engagement going. Uh, friends and colleagues in the UK have been uh, particularly uh, great and supportive. So we're hoping here in New Zealand to, um, in the next few weeks, have a, a session with MPs sort of trying to develop, a, a, if you will, friends of Kanzuk. Um, we had Lord Hannon speak uh, to us a while back. We'd like to follow that up with some speakers because ultimately for me, Kanzuk is good for trade, uh, but it's much, I mean, I'm sure James Skinner will be listening at some point, uh, but I get this wrong, he can he can chase me down. But you know, for me, uh, trade is good, uh, but it's that movement of people, um, but it's also that whole geopolitical side that if we can stand together uh, as friends, we can speak with a much more common voice. Uh, and as I say, certain players in the geopolitical sphere try to separate us out. What could be more powerful uh, than these four nations working together? Talking of James Skinner, I was actually on a meeting with him last week and uh, we, we were talking about, um, I think something he's proposed or he may have actually done this with you is a sort of skilled migration kind of plan. I think he uh, recently did a presentation um, with a couple of UK-based MPs where he talked about how 
there are various professions um, in the Cancer, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, um, where there should be uh, easier migration for these uh, professions. I um, mean, he did a whole presentation, which was really, really interesting. Um, and he's it, obviously really pushed in terms of the, the um, migration side of things. Is that something that you would like to see uh, in um, New Zealand as well, that, that uh, freedom of almost movement between these countries? Absolutely. It's, it's a no brainer, uh, as I might say, maybe others do as well. It's a no brainer. Um, I don't really see any um, risks. It's the similarity in our countries. It's one of the reasons why Kanzuk needs to start with the four nations we have is that if we were to, if you have at will in a thought experiment, open the borders tomorrow, COVID aside, uh, between our nations, uh, we're not going to be overrun uh, by Brits. Uh, and nor is the UK going to be, well, further over, overrun by Kiwis. Um, th there's sort of a natural symmetry there, uh, with the added bonus that actually the skill sets that, say, the UK has are skills that New Zealand would be happy to, to take on board, and vice versa, and the same with Canada and Australia. So um, I, I see positives there. I think there's a general positive affinity of New Zealanders towards the UK, to Canada, Australia. It's, it's really, I suppose the challenge for Kanzuk is it's so simple. Um, and so paradoxically, it, it sometimes just doesn't register with people. So we're, that's my challenge here in New Zealand is to make that which is relatively simple, more obvious. I think everyone here and friends of Commonwealth, we're big fans of Kanzuk and so that we really hope to see being uh, pushed forward. Um, well, thank you for your time today, Simon. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you. Um, hopefully we can do this again sometime soon and hopefully it can be in person and not in the not too distant future. Well, I'm overdue getting back to London, uh, I must say. Um, I enjoyed my recent uh, trip there, including a wonderful tour of your um, foreign and commonwealth office. Um, just stunning, but equally, you're both and your supporters very welcome down here once we reopen those borders. Definitely, definitely hoping to someday in, in the near future. Thanks, thanks so much, Simon. It was great to, to chat to you again. And like Sunil said, hopefully yeah, in a few months' time we can catch up again and um, see how things are going. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for all you're doing, guys. Thank you.